Good afternoon. My name is Tyler Sams. I'm the preacher for the Judson Road Church of Christ in Longview, Texas, and I'm joined today by my good friend, Sean Chancellor, who preaches for the Georgia Street Church of Christ in Amarillo, Texas. Sean, how are you doing today? Man, I'm doing great, Tyler. How are you? I am doing very well. I'm excited to uh, talk about what we have uh, put together today. With the election coming up tomorrow, Tuesday, uh, we're filming this on Monday, uh, Sean and I thought it might be appropriate to just put together a few thoughts uh, for those of us who are Christians uh, about the upcoming election and perhaps help help ourselves get a little bit of perspective mm. on it. Yeah, and I so think that would be a needful thing, a helpful thing for us to do right now. And so with that being said, Sean and I want to talk with you this afternoon about three things we need to remember about Election Day. And the first thing that we would bring to your attention is, is the fact that we as Christians we belong to an enduring kingdom. Uh, Sean, I know you've heard much the same thing that I have here recently. There's a lot of people who are worried about the outcome of this election. They're worried mm. about what it might mean for the morality of our nation, what it might mean for the future of our nation, uh, what it might mean for our local communities and how people might react in our local communities to the results of the election. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's one of those times, I guess, like every other election that's ever been, we're told it's the most important election ever. And, you know, everything hinges on what goes on Tuesday. And, I, you know, when, if you listen to that a lot, it's it's hard not to be concerned, um, regardless of where you kind of fall on the political spectrum. I think we're all hearing the same thing. And so I think it's certainly worth kind of being grounded a little bit today and getting a little bit of perspective before we kind of get into this final final 24 hours, 48 hours, whatever it is, waiting on this election to, to be done. I think that's a good point. So, Sean, I, I think one of the best passages in the Bible that we could go to to remind ourselves uh, that, that we're part of, of an unmovable, unshakable kingdom mm. uh, is probably Daniel chapter 2. Uh, there's a story here, Sean, in Daniel chapter 2 uh, about a, a king of Babylon by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And, and Sean, talk to us a little bit. What is this dream that Nebuchadnezzar has? Well, he's had this dream of this, this great image that he sees. It's apparently in the shape of a man, and uh, it's made of various different metals. And, you know, what we find out is that each of the metals, each of the sections of the statue, as it were, represent different kingdoms the golden head of course represents babylon and you move all the way down to the feet and what you see there is the roman army or excuse me the roman nation um, and then of course we move on to a different kingdom uh, one that's going to be made without hands that is a spiritual kingdom and of course the the message i think of this this dream and the prophecy attached to it is that it is that that kingdom god creates that kingdom made without hands that is the true kingdom, that's the kingdom that you and I need to be a part of, and that everything that we're seeing, everything that is represented in this dream, uh, God's in control. God, God is, right. is pulling the strings, as it were, to bring about his purpose, and no matter how great these other kings are, whether it's Nebuchadnezzar or Alexander or you, know, you name the Caesar, uh, God is greater. God is in control, and his purposes are, are going to be brought about. I think that's great. As you, as you look there at Daniel chapter 2 and verse 34, um, Daniel is giving the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and he says, You watch while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now you skip down to verse 44. And the interpretation is that in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. There's a certain comfort, Sean, that we can take in, in the fact that, that as Christians, living in, in a world that is constantly in flux, that we have a kingdom that is, that is grounded. Yeah, there's stability to be found in that. 
Um, there, there's somewhere to put our hope and to put our trust that's not going to disappoint us. Um, I, I don't care who your favorite president is. You can find something that he did that disappointed you, uh, that left you wondering, why did he do that? Uh, but when, we, when we're talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, um, there, there's no such problem. You know, every, everything that God has done, he's done uh, in a manner that is, is, first of all, consistent with his nature. But also, he, he has our best interest at heart. And, you know, in that, I'm talking about eternal life. Sure. Um, and he, he's going to provide that. And, of course, there's a, a multitude of blessings that we enjoy along the way. And there, there's no earthly force that's going to change that or destroy that. And so whatever happens on this election day, we need to remember that God's kingdom still stands mm-hmm. and that there's nothing anyone will do that can change that. We're part of an immovable, unshakable kingdom that is going to stand longer than the world will stand. Sean, here's another thing, and perhaps this might be a bit more practical as we go about our day-to-day lives, is that in light of the the coming election, we need to remember, Sean, that people are watching. Uh, Christians are, are not called to live... In, in, in a specific way, simply because other people are watching. But we are called to live a specific way in light of the reality that the lives that we lead are led in public and people are watching. And that's a fine distinction that Jesus is going to make there in the Sermon on the Mount. And Sean, let's just turn over there. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 5 and let's talk very briefly about what this election can't change or shouldn't change. You know, it, it's likely that, that we might, oh, I don't say it's likely, it's possible that we might see a change in leadership. It's possible we would see a, a change uh, in the congressional makeup there in Washington, D.C. Uh, things might change on a local level here in Texas and, and elsewhere. But there are some things that, that shouldn't change. And as Christians, there are some things that must not change whatever the results of the election are going to be on Tuesday. And the first thing, Sean, is there at the very beginning of of, of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, the reality that we cannot let the outcome of this election diminish our light in the midst of this dark world. Sean, would you read those, those verses, verses 13 through 16? Sure. It says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven and that last part is is the crux right this is what he's pointing to that we live in a way that reflects well on our father and would lead others to glorify him yeah we're not living this way because we're trying to bring attention to ourselves we're not living a, a specific way you know to try to pull the wool over other people's eyes but we're living a specific way because that's what god has called us to that's what mm-hmm. god expects of us And if we're going to be, Sean, true servants of that God, then we can't let external circumstances change what we know is right and what God has called us to do. Absolutely. And, and, you know, that that idea of being salt and being light, it's simply the idea of being different. Now, we we could talk a lot more in depth about it, but we're supposed to be different, fundamentally different than the world around us. And what I see the world around me being involved in right now is just, chaotic dissension and division. Uh, Hmm. The last thing I want to do is contribute to that. The last thing I want to do is be part of that. Now, you know, I get to have my opinion. Uh, I I mentioned last night as I was preaching, I have an opinion on most things. And uh, (laughs) I happen to think they're right because that's my opinion. But, you know, and that's fine. I think we're all, you know, we all have the right to that. But how am I going to express that? Uh, am I going to represent my opinions as zero-sum games? In other words, you either agree with me or else. 
Uh, that seems to be what's going on in our society right now. The last thing I want to do is contribute to that or participate in that uh, because there's not a lot of love. There's not a lot of grace in that attitude. And, and I think that's important for us to remember that, that we're here not only to tell people about the judgment of God, but also the grace of God and the love of God. And, and if I can't share that message, not only with my preaching, but also with my actions, then I'm, I'm not this kingdom citizen that Jesus is describing in Matthew chapter 5. That's a great point, Sean. And, and I know the, the context in which we're discussing today and the context that Matthew is recording here in, in Matthew 5 might be just a little bit different, but, sure. but I think there is a similar theme. Uh, you look at verse 7 of chapter 5. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. I understand we might be talking on a bit of a different level here, but there's still the reality that if we're going to be this kingdom citizen, if we're going to be this follower of Christ, uh, being a peacemaker is, is, is part of the job, part of the mm -hmm. responsibility. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and we can't compartmentalize that either. That, no. It's not just in the church. Right. And I, I think that becomes obvious in the section we just read, 13 through 16. We're taking these, these attitudes that are described in, in the Beatitudes, and we're showing them to the world. That's how we're salt and light. So, yeah, I mean, I should be a peacemaker in my local church, but I should just as you know, I should be just as much of a peacemaker in my community to whatever to whatever extent that I have opportunity. Sure. I certainly don't want to contribute to hostility and hatred by the way I right. express my opinions. Sure, and I think Sean, I think we'll probably talk about that from Romans chapter twelve here in just a few moments. But we want to make sure, as you as you so eloquently pointed out there, that, that we don't allow the outcome of this election. Uh, to diminish our light in this dark world. Uh, as you move on through Matthew chapter 5, uh, and going along with what you just said, we cannot let the outcome of this election lead us to treat other people poorly. Sean, we, we have seen this in our recent history, haven't we, that things don't break people's way on, on the, the national scene, and suddenly... The people with whom I disagree politically now become my enemy in every facet of life. Yeah, and, and that may be where things are a little bit different today than they've been in the past. I, I don't remember a time, and maybe my memory's faulty, but I don't remember a time where you know, you, you've seen this kind of hatred and hostility based on political things. And, you know, I wasn't around in the 60s for some of what went on then. So maybe maybe some would say that was what was going on then. But, um, you know, in the times that I can remember, we haven't seen that. But that seems to be exactly how it is now. If we don't agree politically, we can't be friends. And maybe more than that, we have to be mortal enemies and actually go yeah. out in the street and fight it out, which is just ridiculous if you ask me sure. just considering the way that that well a lot of political things have broken down but uh, it's kind of sad and and, and especially when and, and and i think there is merit in this when we see sides in this political theater calling for civility which i think <laughs> you and i would agree we we need a whole lot more civility Sure. Uh, you you can't very well advocate for civility and then go about in your personal life and, and act in an uncivil manner and then bemoan the fact that there is no civility. Yeah, I, I wonder sometimes if these people have looked up the word civility as they're calling for it and then acting in a very different way. Um, but again, you know, the last thing we want to do as Christians is participate in that. Right. Um, and, and, you know, I, I doubt many many Christians are out in the streets throwing, you know, Molotov cocktails, but boy, I could, I could do just as much damage and, and add to the hostility just as much with my keyboard on Facebook um, as, as I can standing out in the street in a protest. And uh, I, I think we ought to be just as careful uh, what we're writing and what we're saying and what we're suggesting on social media, because the reach that that can have, uh, is is probably a lot greater than we may realize at the moment. The reach and the lasting impact of Absolutely. what we say. Absolutely. So, Sean, what we're getting at here is is we cannot we cannot let what happens in this election energize us 
to, to treat other people poorly. Look, look at Matthew chapter 5, mm-hmm. verses 43 and 44. I'm not saying that we ought to view people that disagree with us uh, politically as enemies. I'm not saying that at all. But Jesus would address kingdom citizens here mm-hmm. as they are viewing their enemies. And, and if we are supposed to treat our enemies in the way that Jesus describes here, then, then I think that's a lesson to us about how we should treat people who might fall, you know, lower than our enemies. They might not reach that rank of enemy, uh, right, but there's right. still a manner in which we ought to treat these people. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you in order that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. Whether or not we we agree with people, and Sean, whether or not we agree with people, even on biblical principles, doesn't doesn't somehow absolve us from the responsibility to treat people with kindness and respect and to love them and to pray for them. Oh, that's absolutely true. And, you know, what you're saying is right. We, we all not have enemies in a political sense, but the principle, those right. with whom we differ, uh, it, it's certainly there. And I don't know about you, Tyler. Is there anything more difficult or maybe more counterintuitive in the Sermon on the Mount than, than these few verses right here? Pray for your enemy. You know, you're, you're imploring for their good before God, which how do I then call them my enemy? You know, there, there's. Right. A, I think there's a little irony in what Jesus is so. saying here. Uh, we ought to remove that enmity as we as we appeal for someone uh, before the Creator, and uh, I, the attitude that's being expressed in that it, it doesn't leave a lot of room. Again, we've we've used that word hostility for, for the kind of hostility that we're seeing, and we may be tempted to participate in in our political conversations. It's an attitude which if both parties have that attitude, we start to move away from from the poles as enemies and we start to find common ground. And I think, Sean, that's even what we see as we move through the New Testament and look at the New Testament church, for instance, with the Jews and the Gentiles and how they move from enemies to now being together in one body. And then, Sean, I, I think at the end of chapter 6, Matthew records something from Jesus that I think is really important this time of year. And, and, and that is, folks, folks can get worried about the election. And folks can get worried about the outcome of the election. You know, what, what's going to happen um, to my retirement? What's going to happen to my paycheck? What's going to happen to my job? What's going to happen to my retirement account? Uh, what's going to happen, you know... To, to my kids, what kind of nation, uh, what kind of world are they going to inherit? And, and Sean, sometimes we can be so overwhelmed with those questions that we lose sight of the God who has promised us an unshakable, immovable kingdom. Mm-hmm. We need to make sure we don't allow the outcome of this election to draw our focus away from our Heavenly Father. Listen, uh, as I read from Matthew chapter 6 and verse 31. Where Jesus says, do not be anxious or do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or with what shall we clothe ourselves? For after all of these things, the Gentiles eagerly seek, but your heavenly father knows that you need all of these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Sean, i got a question for you. Jesus says here, depending on the translation you're reading from, don't be anxious or don't worry. And he says it twice, once at the beginning in verse 31, once at the end in verse 34. Sean, does that mean I, I can't be nervous about the future? Well, if that's what he's saying here, then I'm having a hard time reconciling some other places in the New Testament, uh, specifically Jesus himself in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
as he was in great distress, as he sweat great drops as of blood, or great drops of blood, depending on how you read that. Uh, you know, if, if you'll go and look, uh, I love Kenny Chumley's commentary on that particular section. He draws all of those terms that are used to describe the mental state of Jesus in that moment. And he just shows that, that these are the strongest terms that you can use to describe mental distress, emotional distress. And if that's not what worry is in, in some sense, then I don't know what worry is. Yeah. Um, I don't believe that Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 is saying that there's nothing in the, the physical realm that is worth our, our concern or worth uh, you know consideration about the future. Uh, it, it just doesn't fit with what you see going on in other places. Um, if that's the case, then then why do we have the pattern that we have for caring for needy saints uh, yeah. in the New Testament church? Uh, God is God is always looked forward to to you know demonstrate His concern about the things that will or may come. I don't know why I could not do that now. I can't allow myself to be immobilized by what I think might happen and, and allow myself to lose my conviction or, or to find myself unable to serve the Lord and act out of faith because of what I think is going to happen. Uh, a lot of times what I think is going to happen is not what happens, first of all. And secondly, regardless of, of what does happen, I still have an obligation and a duty. You know, Jesus is in the garden and he's praying and he's distressed and he's, you know, he's sweating profusely. And then he gets up and he goes to the cross. You know, he doesn't allow that to immobilize him or to change his mind or to diminish his, uh, his desire to serve the Father. Instead, what you see is he deals with that and then he moves forward. And I think this is very much what Jesus is saying here, that we need to have the proper priority system. Uh, we need to see spiritual things as being more important than physical things and not to allow our concern about the physical to override us. Um, yeah. I doubt there's a person watching this video that doesn't have tomorrow's food in the refrigerator right now. Uh, and and if, if I'm going to take this perfectly literally, then that's a sinful worry and, and I ought not be doing that. None of us believe that because that's not what he's saying. Right. Um, and, and, and I think that is important. You know, you mentioned some things. You know, how we're going to live in our old age is a valid concern and something we ought to think about, right? We, we ought to make preparation so that we're not a burden on the church if for no other reason. Uh, so if, if you think there might be some changes made that could diminish that and you're concerned about it, okay. I, you know, that's fair. I, I think sure. that's something that's realistic and and worthy of our concern. But is it changing who you are? Is, is that concern point. so great that you couldn't worship God yesterday because you were worried about what's going to happen Tuesday? If that's where you're at, then then you have a problem, and and something needs to give, something needs to change in the way you're looking at the world around you. Sean, would you agree with me that verse 33 here in chapter 6 is kind of central to understanding this, this section? The kind of worry that Jesus is forbidding here is a worry that, that, would, that would supplant God and his kingdom as our priority in this life. Absolutely. Absolutely. If we're maintaining God as our priority, if we're maintaining our focus and confidence on him verse 32, and his ability to provide for us, that there may be things in the future that, that cause us some trepidation, that, that cause us some worry, using that term loosely, but it doesn't strip our eyes away from our focus on Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith. We trust that, that God is able to provide for us and can bring us through whatever situation we, we might face. That's the lesson from Hebrews chapter 11. If we can keep that kind of focus, there are moments of trepidation and, and worry in the future, sure. but we can overcome those knowing that we have somebody going back to the 23rd Psalm who is willing to walk through the valley of the shadow of death with us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We're not alone in this. That, that's a great point. Great point. So, 
so let's remember that, that people are watching us. They're watching how we're going to react uh, to the election, and we need to react in a manner that is consistent with our calling. And then let's wrap up by remembering that, that our allegiance is elsewhere. Sean, did you grow up in school saying the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes, I did. I did too. I did too. And I remember the day when uh, our principal at Greenbrier High School uh, left out a phrase in the pledge by mistake and everybody thought it was a big a big scandal. And the next day when he said the Pledge of Allegiance, he made sure that, that he emphasized uh, <laughs> the phrase that he left out so that he didn't get in trouble. It was just an honest mistake. Uh, but we grew up saying that the Pledge of Allegiance, and around this time of year, we, we talk a lot about allegiance and the flag in America. And, and I don't have a problem at all being patriotic, Sean. I, I don't think there's anything in the Bible that would prohibit somebody from being proud, in the right sense, of their of their country. Sure. Especially but, a nation that has given us the provisions that we have here for the freedom to assemble and worship. I mean, sure. patriotism in a sense is a demonstration of gratitude for that, if nothing else. It's a great way to view it. And so while these days tend to, to bring out some patriotic fervor, we need to remember, first, uh, the president is not God. Whether that's Donald Trump, whether that's uh, Joe Biden, Mike Pence, uh, Kamala Harris, uh, Joe Johnson ru- running, uh, or not Joe Johnson, yeah, Joe, running running third party, right? Whoever it might be, the president is not God. And, and, and I know, Sean, that's kind of a duh statement that, that we all get that. <laughs> but we need to remember Jesus' words there in Matthew chapter 12. We're supposed to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mm. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier about Sometimes we're tempted to to put so much of our time and effort and energy into our worry about uh, the economy and and the the political state of our nation. We need to make sure God is maintained as the priority in our lives, that Mm -hmm. we're seeking after Him and His will, and that we're devoting ourselves to Him entirely. And and, and sometimes, Sean, that can become challenging at, at this time of year. Absolutely. And, and, you know, again, it's that idea of getting consumed with things that should have second place or second priority, if even that high in our lives. Um, And maybe a recognition that, you know, we do have some freedoms that that are, are, are we ought to appreciate. And if we think those are going to be limited, then naturally we, you know, we're concerned about that. Uh, But when you think about many of the New Testament passages, your Romans chapter 13 comes to my mind and, and who it was that was ruling when, when Paul tells us that the government is God's minister of justice. Um, you know, he's probably writing that during the reign of Nero. And it, you know, and here's a man who actually wanted people to worship him as God, by the way. And, and in that moment, God, God through the Holy spirit, through the apostle Paul says, calm down. <laughs> you know, yeah. they're, they're, he's not the end all. He's not the be all. Um, even even with a ruler like that, government's still capable of carrying out its God ordained purpose, and we're still capable of submitting. And that's sure. exactly what we're told we ought to do. And so we need to remember: no, the president is not God, but God is, <laughs> and He's told us to submit to the government. Sure, um, and, and we don't need to get confused about that. And I think, Sean, right along with that is this reality that, that America is not the church, right? Sometimes we can take this idea of American exceptionalism too far and, and mm-hmm. kind of, uh, of put an American spin on the church and on the Bible, on the New Testament. And the reality is, Sean, that's, that's problematic. Yeah. Yeah, I think that puts us in some very dangerous places. Sure. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, when you, when you read what, what Paul had to say about the church here, he says in verse 4 of chapter 2, God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And you come over to verse 13. And he continues, now in Christ Jesus, 
you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, tying in this idea that we saw back earlier in chapter 2. For he himself, that is Christ, is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into one man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. The idea here that that Paul is emphasizing two groups, and I think in the context, Sean, Jews and Gentiles, two groups being made one, one body, united in the body of Jesus Christ, reconciled through Jesus' sacrifice. Uh, The church is not exclusive to one nation or one ideology. The church is comprised of all of those individuals from whatever country, whatever nationality, whatever political ideology, and whatever circumstances under which they might have lived, people who have bowed the knee to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unity regardless of whatever social divisions we may we may think we see that that's what we have in the church or at least what we should have in the church it supersedes uh race it supersedes gender it supersedes social status it supersedes nationality and if we forget that then we begin dismantling the church we begin destroying what it intends it's intended to be and to do for us need to be careful we don't remake the church into our own image rather than mm-hmm. allowing the church to be what Christ established it to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and then flip over to Romans chapter 12 with me, Sean. I, I think this is a worthy point to bring up. We need to remember that in whatever circumstances we find ourselves come Wednesday morning, if we know the results of the election by then, Uh, We need to remember what God's people are called to be. I'm looking at Romans chapter 12 and verse 17, where Paul says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Christians are to be honorable people, Sean. The way that we conduct ourselves, uh, whether we're talking uh, in our civil affairs, whether we're talking about our business dealings, whether we're talking about in our homes, we're, we're to be honorable people. Mm-hmm. Verse 18. And that, oh, that, sorry. Idea of, uh, that idea of honorable is not determined by what other people are doing to us. That's a standard that is based on who God is and how God would have his people to act. So, you know, if we wake up Wednesday morning and there are groups of people that are mistreating us, that does not justify us in the eyes of God to go out and act like they're acting. That doesn't change what honorable is. And, uh, you know, it might be something we need to meditate on tonight before the results come out tomorrow and, and really start preparing ourselves uh, to simply deal with that. You know, we started in Daniel. That's a great place to go and see that because yeah. Daniel Daniel maintains the same character for 70 years. And, and sometimes he's treated well. Most of the time in the book, he's not. He's the same guy all the way through. And uh, that's exactly who and what we ought to be. You know, the Sermon on the Mount's not modified based on our condition or, or our social situation or how other people are treating us. Um, you know, Jesus was giving that to people who were being mistreated. And, and so we need to be very, very firm in our character um, in, in the coming days. And, Sean, I think that leads right into chapter 12 and verse 18. If possible, Paul says, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. It's interesting, uh, Sean, the, the way that Paul prefaces that. Number one, if possible. Number two, so far as it depends on you, realizing uh, Christians are to be peacemakers, but a lot of times uh, that may be a very high hurdle, not necessarily because of a lack of effort on the Christian's part, but sure. upon a, a lack of, of reception on the part of others. Right. You know, someone may decide they view me as their enemy, and I may decide I'm not going to be their enemy. But they can still see me that way. Sure. And, and there may not be much that I can do about it. Um, 
But, you know, back to what we were noticing there in the Sermon on the Mount, I still ought to be praying for them and then act as if I prayed for them. It's not (laughs) pray for them and then go out and treat them like an enemy. (laughs) Uh, It's pray for them and then love them. Um, And and that doesn't require them to respond in kind. Uh, You know, Romans chapter 5 kind of lays that out in our relationship with God. While we were yet enemies, what does he do? Sends his son to die for us. Um, why wouldn't we treat our fellow man the same way, or why shouldn't we treat our fellow man the same way? Great point. And then followed up by what Paul says there at the end of the chapter in verse 20, uh, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Christians are to be honorable, peaceful, and kind, kind, Sean, even uh, to people we might view as our enemies, or more to the point, uh, people who might view us as their enemies. Yeah, and you might point out that uh, the point of verse 20 is not to pour the coals of fire on their head. I, I think sometimes we kind of read that passage, hopefully in a joking yeah, way. Rubbing our where hands. Where it's kind of like, yeah, yeah what, what passive-aggressive thing can I do to make them feel bad? <laughs> that That's not his point. You know, in the background of this whole chapter is the cross. Yeah. And I, I think that's what Paul is doing is we're standing we're standing and looking back at the cross and we're saying, in light of what Jesus has done for me, what should I do and how should I behave toward others? And and I think that really comes out in verse twenty. You know, in light of the fact that Jesus died for me while I was yet a sinner, how should I treat those who have placed themselves in opposition to me? Well, I, I should I should treat them with grace and with mercy and with love and with kindness, uh, you know, and that may that may have the result of causing them to feel ashamed. Hopefully, to a point that it brings them to repentance and to see the grace of God, not so that they'll somehow you know I get to win, you know, in, yeah. in some in some way, and and so you know maybe this is kind of the whole point we're trying to make today, is is we need to focus on the cross a lot more than we're focusing on whatever's going on in our nation right now because our hope is in the cross, not in the election. That's a great point, Sean, and that brings us, I think, over here to to, to maybe some confessions here at the end. Sean, I, there's a lot of things I don't know. We, we could fill a book with what I don't know. I don't know, nor do you, who the next president will be. Uh, I don't know, nor do you, what Congress will look like. Uh, I don't know how, if at all, my life is going to be fundamentally altered by the events of Tuesday and moving into Wednesday. But, Sean, here's what I do know. I do know that if the day after the election comes, which, by the way, is not promised to us, but if it does come, I know that God's still going to be in control. That's the message. If we learn nothing else from the book of Daniel, we learn that. And and I understand that the circumstances, the surrounding events in Daniel are different than than our day today. Let's just get that on the table. But there is still that overarching message, God is in control. And And we're in that unshakable kingdom that's described. Exactly. I, I think also what I know is that if the day after the election comes... God wants me to be a light. We live in a world, John chapter 3, that is full of darkness. And in that world of darkness, Matthew chapter 5, we are called to be light. Light that would guide and show men who our Father is. Mm. And Sean, what else I know, as you just mentioned, is that I'm a part of an unmovable kingdom. And I think that's something we need to remind ourselves of over and over Mm -hmm. again. If we're called as we are in 1 Peter to be strangers and sojourners and pilgrims, it's because our home is not here. But we are part of an unmovable and unshakable kingdom that is far better, and that is where we are residents. That is where we are citizens, and that's where our hope is, bound up with the king of that kingdom, Jesus. And how about this, Sean, from Romans chapter 8? Here's what I know is, Whatever happens in the election, should we live to see after the election? There's nothing external 
that can separate me from the love of God which is found in Christ Jesus. Paul, Paul no. would say, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, it's a great moment to think about that passage. And, and to, to reassure ourselves, Sean, this is what's important in life. Mm-hmm. Being being recipients of the love of God, responding to the love of God, taking up the cross and following His Son, that's what's meaningful in this life. That's where we Absolutely. will find our fulfillment. So, Sean, let let me let's let's submit to our audience three challenges for for Wednesday. Should we wake up Wednesday morning and and find out? you know, what Congress is going to look like and what the White House is going to look like, regardless of who is in there. I've got three challenges here. The first one, Sean, as we're looking at 1 Timothy, is that we need to say a prayer for whomever the new president will be. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Paul would say, First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings, be made on behalf of all men, for kings and for all who are in authority, in order that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Uh, Sean, that sounds like meaningful and purposeful prayer, regardless of of whomever is the ruling authority. It it does not sound like an imprecatory prayer either. (laughs) No, it doesn't. (laughs) But it is a directed prayer, you know, Mm -hmm. and it might be, it might be that whomever occupies the office, you just disdain their character uh, from a moral perspective. Sure. And and that may be the case. I don't think that would be altogether different, Sean, than than the context in which Paul is writing to Timothy here. Mm -hmm. But even in the midst of that, there's something prayer worthy. And it's to pray for the king and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. And Sean, here's the remarkable thing about prayer in Scripture. When we go to God in prayer, Sean, we don't have to have the answers. Mm. We don't have to dictate to God uh, how best to do his job or, or what solutions to bring about. Well, that's a great point, and I think that's one of the reasons that prayer is given to us as an anecdote to anxiety, is is I don't have to have the answer. Matter of fact, I'm going to God in prayer because I don't have the answer more often than not, and and I can trust God uh, to work things out in in the way that's best, especially when we're thinking about our spiritual well-being and spiritual life. Sean, what's a challenge that, that you have for everybody on Wednesday? Well, let's just get that second one there. Play your role for fulfilling the will of God. Um, I, I don't care who the president, Congress, governor, mayor, what you know, you name it. I can still get up Wednesday morning and I can I can teach the gospel. I can I can read my Bible. I can I can be a husband and a father as God would have me to be. So I can shine my light. I can live a righteous life. Um, maybe, maybe I'll find myself enriched as a result of the election. That's never happened yet, but maybe it will. Uh, maybe I'll find myself impoverished as a result of the election. I think that's far more likely regardless of the result. None of that's going to prevent me from being able to be a godly person. Um, and, uh, boy, that's something we need to remember. You know, and there's there's often some scares about, well, there's some religious freedoms and liberties that might be taken away from us that still doesn't prevent me from being a godly person. Even if that were the case, I can still be a godly person. Um, You know, it it seems to me that God used that very situation in the book of Acts to spread the gospel Yep. uh, in in more than one situation. Uh, So I can, I can wake up Wednesday morning regardless. And I can, I can simply be the person that God would have me to be. You know, we're in first Timothy two, notice verses three and four. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And, and there's, there's nothing that's going to happen Wednesday morning that's going to prevent that from, from being the case. And Sean, that's, 
when we talk about a, a difficult political, governmental environment in which to live as a Christian, that's been the experience of, of centuries of Christians going back mm-hmm. to the first century. And if, if they've managed to do it, and, and should that be something that we're faced with in our generation, Sean, I think those who resolve to follow Christ will find a way to do it. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, it kind of reminds me, we were talking about Romans chapter 8 just a moment ago, and there at the end of the chapter, there's that quotation from the Psalms about the prophets saying, we've been killed all day long. You know, what's his point? You're not the first Christian to suffer. You're not going to be the last Christian to suffer. This is what it is to be a Christian. Um, you but there's something your better. And go. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There's something better. Let and then, and then Sean, let's let's wrap up with this. Number one, we would challenge you to say a prayer for whomever the new president will be. Number two, we would challenge you to to play your role in fulfilling the will of God, sharing the gospel. Uh, of the God who wants all men to be saved. And then I would challenge you as well, Sean and I would challenge you, to, to remember who the real king is. Here in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 16, Paul says, And yet for this reason I found mercy, in order that in me as the foremost Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Verse 17. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Sean, that's who the real King is. Mm -hmm. And His reign is one that is immortal and eternal because He is the only God. And when we remember him as our king, when we remember him as our Lord, when we remember him and the kingdom that he has provided us, a kingdom which will not be destroyed, we can have the confidence to face any sort of difficulty, hardship, or anxiety that may present itself before us. Amen. Sean, I appreciate you joining in for this study today. Anything you want to say as we wrap up? Well, I mean, thanks for calling me. Thanks for thanks for putting this together. This was Tyler's idea today, and uh, he just called me and said, "Hey, this is what we're going to do. Get online." And, uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Things I needed to think about, and I'm sure that other people do as well. So, uh, I appreciate you doing that. Well, Sean, I always appreciate you being gracious to my demands, and uh, I'll be sure to make <laughs> more of them in the future. But seriously, we appreciate all of you joining with us, whether you're listening today, Monday, whether you're listening Tuesday, Wednesday or some time way off in the distant future, maybe when Sean and I are both dead like Rover, dead all over, our voices are being preserved by the YouTube algorithms. Uh, We thank you for listening. We hope you have a fantastic day. And we pray that you would find your place in God's will and that you would live to his glory. Have a nice day.